How's it going, everybody? Andrew Zarian here, Wrestling Observer Live. We're here every day, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern, with that stooge Brian Alvarez. 1 p.m. on Saturdays with Jim Valley, and Sundays with me. You know, I got paid to say that. Don Callis called me up first thing this morning and said, you better call Brian Alvarez a stooge in the intro of the show. A lot to talk about today, last night. Pretty solid paper. I like this show. Very much did. It was a fun show. The ending was interesting because either people loved it because they hated seeing what happened or they hated it because they didn't want to see it happen. So it was all done for the right reasons. How they ended Brian Danielson's full-time career. We're going to talk about that, obviously. We don't know what this means. Will he wrestle a couple, five times a year, six times a year, two times a year? Maybe he'll come back next year. We don't know. But obviously the fallout from Wrestle Dream is the big story here. Mox is the new AEW World Heavyweight Champion. You know, that man has turned into the ace for this company. He has always been there for every important shift that they've had to do. And he's part of a really important storyline here that we don't really know where it's leading to. We'll speculate on that. Also, a very somber media scrum. Pretty much the highlight was Don Callis. That was the big part of this. Also, some highlights from SmackDown. If we can get to it in the return of Roman Reigns, they're gearing up to go to Saudi Arabia. That's a big story there. But a whole lot to talk about. I want to get your thoughts on this. Hit me up on X, at Andrew Zarian. I want to know what you thought of this show. There's a lot of diverse opinions here. When we come back, we're going to break it all down for you. Wrestling Observer Live here on Sports Byline. Stay tuned. Wrestling Observer Live here on Sports Byline. A very somber day for the world of professional wrestling. Brian Danielson's full-time career has come to an end. Ended by John Moxley. You know, it's interesting. I saw some sort of statistic, right? Danielson's last WrestleMania was with Roman. His last match on Raw was against Seth. And it, the end of his full-time career is with John Moxley. It just, it, I mean, to kind of put into perspective how dominant those three have been in the world of professional wrestling over the last decade. It's, it's actually remarkable. To see that, that they've been in the mix in major, major programs, multiple promotions. But, you know, this is interesting. I think you guys know, and if you follow anything that I've done outside of this, you guys very well know that Danielson is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. And during the break, I was trying to figure out when was the first show I saw him at, because I did see him at the Hammerstein. I did see him at those Manhattan Center uh, matches, but. I, I could have sworn I saw him somewhere else. And I did in 2003 at the Elks Lodge. And you know what that match was? 21 years later. That match was against Samoa Joe at the Elks Lodge. August 2nd, 2003. I remember being there. You know, it, it's. It is a fascinating thing to live through someone's entire career. This is one of the first times, you know, if you think about it, you know, for my generation, I'm 40, that I've been able to witness somebody from the beginning. And I remember, along with a lot of you, I remember hearing about the American Dragon, Brian Danielson, with Dave. Dave would speak about him on Wrestling Observer Radio when he was on IATA. I was a subscriber to The Observer, so I would read about it. You heard all about American Dragon. He was a prodigy of Shawn Michaels, which was he? He was in that, that, that graduate, I guess, the graduating class. Remember the top stars for Shawn Michaels' promotion, MG? I could tell you them. I barely do. Go I ahead. I could tell you them. I don't know them that well. It was Danielson, and he wore a mask. Yep. Uh, Lance Cade, Spanky, who passed away, right? And Venom. Yep. There was a guy named <laughs> wow. Venom there. Those were his top stars there. But Danielson, you know, you're talking about that's 1999. This guy has been around for forever. 
and has been remarkable his entire career. Other than injuries, there's not been a lull period in this man's career. It's always been an upward trajectory. And, you know, his his just his pure in-ring ability has told the story of, of his career and pro wrestling. Nothing bigger than that moment winning at WrestleMania. Nothing bigger than winning the AEW World Title. I he thought has, that one was pretty cool. AEW really World did. Title. I really you know, I, I, yeah. I get it. I, and I'm glad that they did it. They had to do it. I, I think it adds so much to the legacy of that company. And again, we talk about the history books. And this is something WWE has been very aggressive about for the last five or six so years. Since that Universal title came out. They want to tell the story of the importance of the title by the men who hold it. And the women, for the women's title, obviously. But we're talking about the specific title. That's why a Bill Goldberg had that title. That's why a Brock Lesnar had that title. And AEW does the same exact thing. There's a reason why Chris Jericho was a world champion. There's a reason why Kenny Omega had it. Obviously, CM Punk. It's not just giving the title to the biggest names. It's putting the title on people that will build the legacy of your championship. And Brian Danielson being a world champion, it would be silly if it wasn't. Especially in AEW. Best so match, back in your opinion? This, I, your favorite match. What What is your favorite match of Brian Danielson? Oh, I mean, I think that for me, because maybe it's just biased because it's so soon, uh, but the Swerve match, the AEW title. That was, chain, it, it, that was a remarkable chain, match, yeah. Yeah, it was great. It's, I'm sure if I think about it, I'm going to come up with one, like on a, a random show that was better, I'm sure, but, yeah. Yeah, you know, there's you know. a couple that stand out. I mean, I've been, again, I've been to so many Danielson matches. Uh, his match with Kenny Omega at that first Grand Slam was most, most likely one of the most perfect draws you've ever seen in, in American wrestling. They went 30 minutes and nobody cared that it was a draw. Nobody was upset that it was a draw finish. You were just happy you got to see these two have a match. Which, by the way, I don't think we're, it, it's, it's, too crazy of me to say that they will wrestle again. Just we don't know Most when. Most likely. I would yeah. hope so. Mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, one one ridiculous one is the Bray Wyatt steel cage match. Because that was the moment that he, was a good he, one. he became, I mean, that was, that company realized that they had something extremely special. In his concussed way, he was able to get that crowd to do that yes chant, which kind of Set the path for everything else. I had but, one that, yeah, that just me. popped in my head. So I, I don't know what year it was, and I saw it online. I've never saw it live. I saw it, but Tyler Black versus uh, Brian Daniel or the American Dragon and ROH. There's one. There's one match in particular where I think they got over just by chain wrestling. Yeah. Um, so Seth Rollins, obviously back in the day and i remember seeing that and going this is fantastic and it was one of the first times i saw a brian danielson match and this is after he was already in wwe um, well, even like look at i'm looking at yeah. his i'm looking at his 2006 cage cage match okay mm -hmm. just yep. first thing that pops up right here and i got tickled brian danielson defeated lance storm in 26 minutes <laughs> at the frontier field house in chicago ridge illinois then he faced R Roderick Strong. Then he faced Delirious. Then Samoa Joe. Then Tony Mamaluk. Alex Shelley. Excalibur. Jimmy Rave. Matt Seidel. I, I mean, AJ Styles. I mean, these are all mega names, mostly. Chris Hero. It's amazing the talent that came out of that one company. He wrestled Mara Fuji for the ROH world title. <laughs> I want to see the Lance Storm match. That's what I want to see. I'm sure Lance is going to message me and yell at me about this. I'm positive of that. But fascinating career, man. Uh, did you, you know, watch it? Because you obviously, you watched along the same with me. Did you mm -hmm. think at that point, you know, like 06, 07, you know, you're realizing obviously he's going to leave and go somewhere. Did you think he would become the star that he was, or do you think he would just be a very underappreciated, tremendous pro wrestler? 
Uh, well, I remember when he. Are we talking when he left ROH? Is that what you, I'm saying. I'm saying when he was in ROH. Did you see him as hmm. being what he is today? Well, I, personally, I didn't follow ROH back then. So when he came in at WWE, I was like, people were talking about him. But you, kn- you like knew he who was he was. Second but, coming. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't. And so it took me a while. And then that's when I think at some point I went back and started looking at matches. And I think, and like I said, the Tyler Black, uh, Brian Daniels one, one stood out to me as one that, but yeah, so I don't know um, exactly when, but yeah, over time you just go, this guy's awesome. You know, it's just. I wow, wonder, I'm, just I'm just scrolling here. Brian Danielson defeated <laughs> Walter in 2008 in WXW. <laughs> think about how long Walter's been around. Unbelievable. He defeated John Moxley in 2007 at MPW. Full circle. <laughs> Full circle, right? Full circle. Amazing. I I did I just want to take some time and talk about this because he he has had a unbelievably remarkable professional wrestling career. He is uh really one of the last pure professional wrestlers that's not affected by producers and TV writers. Uh, he was a pure wrestler, uh, and that's why it was so exciting for me to watch because that's a style that I really like. High impact, versatile. I mean, just incredible. We're going to talk about the card when we come back from break and break down these matches, and I want to get your thoughts. Wrestling Observer Live here on Sports Byline. Stay tuned. Wrestling Observer Live here on Sports Byline. Wrestle Dream Zero Hour. Hey, do me a favor. Follow me on X, at Andrew Zarian. That's where you can find everything I do. Let's talk about Zero Hour. Start off with Brian Cage and Atlantis Jr. for the Ring of Honor TV title. You know, I, I forgot that this was a title match. I was like, so many like false finishes happening here. <laughs> and then I realized it's a title match. <laughs> Brian Cage defeated Atlantis. You know, Cage is one of those guys. What, what a, what a look, what a size, great athleticism. I want to, you know, I just never been presented in a, in a higher capacity. Maybe this is something. We'll see. Anna J defeated Harley Cameron. Did you see the spot here, MG? Um, I was dealing with something. I missed a lot of this match. Okay. I will say real quick. Yeah. Um, Anna J. After going over to Stardom and working their uh, their uh, uh, their tournament, their G one, their G one tournament, uh, she looks much better. Well, no, she looks great, and she's uh, she's mm-hmm. been improving every year, you know. And remember, she's still oh, new yeah. to this, and uh, you know, five years in, it takes a while sometimes. Some people get it immediately. Some people, it takes a little bit. She's improved every single year. She looked great. Here's my issue with this. The okay. referee, Harley Cameron is getting pinned. The referee literally pushes her shoulder down to count the pin. He counts <laughs> one, okay. pushed her shoulder down, <laughs> counts two and three. <laughs> I mean, we could have just... Happen, right? could, that shouldn't happen, right? That shouldn't happen. You could have either just called it as a shoot or whispered it i mean it was so blatantly obvious I, I think maybe he didn't think the camera would see it but the camera was right there is it the ref's fault or is it the camera's fault i'm sure i'll get a message explaining this to me <laughs> now i got that i was into this match oh this one oh mxm collection comes out <laughs> and they come out to a big pop i'm i like this gimmick i don't care what anybody says i'm into it Mansoor and Mason Madden, and they come out with Rico Constantino. <laughs> when I saw this, I was like, "You, what year is it?" <laughs> I, you know what, of. Rico looked great. Rico's in his sixties. I think he's sixty-two years old. I think mm-hmm. people forget what a stud he was in OVW. You know, I think it's a sin that that those OVW tapes do not exist anywhere on the internet. Where can I watch those OVWs from 02 and 01? Good question. That's a great question. You know where I can? I could tell you. I could go in my attic and pull out these tapes that who the hell knows what's on them at this point. 
I I used to tape trade these. That's how I that's how I got it. There was I met some guy on this is how the, all these stories begin. I met some guy on the internet <laughs> and I would buy these tapes from him. Wow. And I would have to send them money orders. <laughs> and he would send me the tapes and it was like I sent some guy like 30 bucks one time and I got like a stack of old VHSs. <laughs> Don't tell me about, you know, the, these kids nowadays could go right on YouTube and see everything that they want. I had to speak to old so, men on the Internet and, and buy cassettes from them. So what you're saying is the, the career of Rico Konstantinov is um, hidden safely in your attic. It's hidden safely in my <laughs> attic. Dude, he was tag partners with John Cena. Crazy. Crazy. And he was mm -hmm. a great wrestler. The problem was he started at 37 years old. He was very he was very old for the pro wrestling business to begin a career. Uh, Rico came out. The acclaimed. Obviously, there was a daddy ass thing happening here, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the relationship between Rico and Billy Gunn. The acclaimed won the match after uh, he gave him a famous sir and uh, Rico ate it on the ground. Cool. I was happy to see Rico. Tony Khan introduced Antonio Inoki's grandsons. And Why was he yelling? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, inside voice, Tony. Use your inside <laughs> voice, not your outside voice. That's what I tell my kids. Uh, Tony was screaming, and he wanted the, the, the crowd to do the Antonio Inoki chant, okay? It just didn't work. <laughs> listen, I, I don't. I, you guys can consider me whatever you want, but I consider. My, I know wrestling. Okay, I know wrestling mm -hmm. history. I couldn't do that chant. <clears throat> okay, I didn't know it. Is it? Is it something that I heard? Sure, I've heard it a million times. I have no idea what it is, and neither did anybody in that building. <laughs> so they go and do it, and Tony's they did obviously karaoke style. <laughs> yeah, Tony's very unsatisfied with this because he didn't get what he wanted. So he's like, we'll do it one more time. And the screen has already changed. There's this awkward thing. Tony's looking up and ah, there it is. And they do it again. Really, you know, sometimes as, as wrestling fans, we think everybody knows everything that we know. And the likelihood of that being true is, is very slim. Uh, but it was nice that Antonio Inoki's grandkids were out there. One of them looked just like him. Mm -hmm. You know, Inoki was a handsome dude. He had a jaw that went for miles. Who has a strong jaw like that anymore? No one. The look of a movie star, that Antonio Inoki. The Outrunners, huge pop here for Turbo Floyd and oh Truth Magnum. Orange Cassidy and Kyle O'Reilly with Rocky Romero defeated John Silver, Alex Reynolds, Tony Nice, and Aria Davari with Evil Uno, Mark Sterling, and Josh Woods. Everybody had to get in on something on this show. There were 50 people out there. The Outrunners are so over. Um, so I was watching my wife. And I was like, you see these two dudes? I'm so into them. She goes, oh, you would be. That's right up your alley. Yeah. <laughs> they are right up my alley, those guys. Fantastic. And listen, man, we're, they have that look. They have the look of the gimmick that they're doing. And I thought it was fantastic. Absolutely loved it. Great, great match. Renee interviewed Okada backstage. Now, I was, again, I'm watching my wife. And she is not familiar with this version of Okada. She knows the name Okada. She knows that he's one of the best wrestlers, because I say it constantly, she had no idea how funny he was. So, <gasps> Renee's interviewing Okada. He says he's cleared, and he's here just to support the Young Bucks. He's approached by Kyle O'Reilly, who asked for a title match, saying that they'd never face each other. Okada then tells him no, and then uses his uh, offensive catchphrase that I cannot say <laughs> He first. He first radio. said he first rubbed his chin and went like, "Let me think about it." Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. yeah. Really... <laughs> and uh, then it's timing, and then he said the word. It was great. Yeah. Then Kyle O'Reilly slapped Okada. Brawl starts. Christopher Daniels uh, kicks them both out of the building. That's how Zero Hour ended, and the pay per view begins with Jay White defeating Hangman Page. Jay White looked great. He did. Listen, you have Hangman an opportunity character. here. This Hangman character is tremendous. Yeah, and he didn't have to win to keep the, keep the character going. That's no. the best part about this. And I'm glad Jay White mm -hmm. won. Jay White needed this win. I, I think elevating this dude into something very special is going to be necessary. You know, they made some very key moves on this show. 
they did. We are also getting a, a writer's change in this company. With Jimmy Jacobs exiting, you know, he's been Tony's right hand guy for a number of years. 2003 specifically. He was very hands on in a lot of key moments. Change is sometimes really good. You meant he, 2023. People, what did I say? Mm -hmm. 2003. That now that would be that would be uh, unbelievable. A time, <laughs> a time warp. I've been in a time warp for weeks now, dude. So, I'm sorry. I don't even know so what Tony was is. like. Ten. Or Tony was. Tony was. No, 2000. Tony's my age. Tony's I think two years older than me or a year older than me. 2003. He would have been uh, in college. Okay. He's writing with Jimmy with Jimmy Jacobs. I mean, that could have been a reality. To be honest, <laughs> that could have been a possibility. Uh, we're seeing these changes and Jay White being presented in this very strong way in a fantastic match with Hangman. You, you're creating another major star. I mean, he's already a star, but now you're elevating this. Another person that came out as a star was, uh, what did you think? You liked this match? I thought this was a tremendous, tremendous match. Oh, this was fantastic. It was all, yeah. it, all it needed to be. I love the Hangman. It, obviously, this is going to continue. They're gonna, we're going to get a nice little program out of this, but yeah. these guys work well together, so yeah. Yeah, very mm -hmm. good. Mariah May defeated Willow Nightingale to retain the AEW title, but the story here was really Willow was over. I very much enjoy what they've done with her. Um, just, I always said, you know, you kind of look at someone's face sometimes, and I and I'm not I'm not making a joke. Here. You look at someone's face and you're like, wow, that what a that that there's just something, just they 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 they're bright, they shine. I think w Willow definitely has that. Jack I also Perry, think that, um, yeah. Oh, real quick, I also think that uh, Bob Britt Baker being sick affected this match because I think they wanted to do Britt Baker here, uh, and I know yeah, that's sure. in we'll get, when we get to the media scrum. I, we we can talk about it there, but yeah, they're definitely setting up Britt Baker for the next challenger. Yeah, it looks it. Mm -hmm. Jack Perry defeated Shibata to retain the TNT title. After the match, Perry attacked Perry attacked from behind and caught him with a belt shot to the face. Daniel Garcia ran down to the ring, face to face with Perry. Perry would bail, and MJF's music would hit. And here's Max. This set up the return for MJF, who took advantage and attacked uh, from the attack from Perry. He said he went to Buffalo and brought his ring back to make Garcia kiss it. And here's Adam Cole's music hitting. MJF looks like a ghost. Cole makes a sprint to the ring. And here are two more returns. Daniel Garcia returned. Last couple of weeks, MJF, Adam Cole, Jay White, and maybe some more. Wrestling Observer Live. We'll be right back after this. Wrestling Observer Live here on Sports Byline. Had to go to a break there, but I want to pick it up here. You know, again, the story of rebuilding, and you're seeing it with this show. Jay White returning, right? The, the, 2025 is going to be a very different year for this company. But if you look at the people that were over here, like the Outrunners, right? They've created a tag team that people are very into. Jay White returning and defeating Hangman Page. Willow Nightingale being presented in a top position. The return of Daniel Garcia after he signed his contract. There's emphasis put on there. MJF returning. Adam Cole coming back. This, it, you know... There's only a few more pieces to this puzzle, right? There's Kenny Omega. There's Adam Copeland. There's Lashley, which will be returning. And whatever else is going to happen, which we'll talk about. Who is making John Moxley do all of this stuff? You really want a higher power, don't you? <laughs> I want, it's going to be a higher power. You know what? It'd be fantastic. Really it comes full circle if it's Chris Daniels. Isn't that full circle? <laughs> oh man <laughs> full circle here <laughs> Takeshita, Osprey, Ricochet possible match of the night here would you say this was the match of the night? it was it was there was so many uh, some of the spots that uh, they are able to do those those sequenced 
German suplexes um, bouncing off of each other were were like a thing of beauty. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a fan of the high, like too much high flying, but they they do it. I right get it, whenever. I get it, and I get why people yeah. complain. Mm -hmm. I understand when mm -hmm. people are like, "This is too flippy for me." I totally understand. But listen, wrestling is uh, you you don't necessarily want the same match. It's different styles, different kinds of matches. I don't have to like everything. I'm not I'm not as high on certain lucha matches as other people are, but I still appreciate. The, the beauty uh, and the brilliance of certain matches. This was not one of those for me. I love this match. I thought Osprey and Ricochet were fantastic. I think Takeshita was there as a great spoil. This match was full of high spots and move combos. It ended with Don Callis getting involved. He comes into the ring with a screwdriver to take out Osprey. A hooded figure shows up. It's Kyle Fletcher, nails him with the screwdriver at the back of the head. Causing Takeshita to get the win. Takeshita now is the new international champion. Right guy for the spot. He was a great base for those two. Yeah. Also. Mm, yeah. It really was. We got Swerve Strickland returning. Prince Nana was in the ring selling his coffee. <laughs> he was a little nervous. Introduces Swerve. Swerve comes out. He says that he's still kind of hurt, but he's cleared. MVP and Shelton Benjamin would come out to the ring to confront him. They ask him to join MVP's group. He says no. He's not going to do it. He told him to. He told him to shove his business card somewhere. Yep, he did. <laughs> uh, and him and Shelton got into into each other's face, and it looks like something is brewing for Wednesday in San Antonio, San San Diego. Nope, San Jose. San Jose. I named all the Sands in <laughs> San Jose. This is probably where we will get Lashley to come in. And I'm very interested in the story and how it's done. Again, they're leading into 2025. Very different company. Hologram defeated the Beast Mortos in a two out of three match. I really like this match. Uh, this match was here to promote the Fox Sports in Mexico TV deal as well. Uh, you know, we're going to get more Lucha with that deal happening. And I welcome it. I loved it in 96 and 97 and 98 when WCW did it. I think it has a place on American TV. I think it's great to attract younger viewers because my kids watched this pay-per-view. They had a sleepover in the living room and they were bored <laughs> because I didn't let them put on YouTube. And they said, well, can we watch wrestling? And I said, sure. And they watched the pay-per-view. And you know what match they loved? This Two one. of them. Hologram and Beast mm -hmm. Mortos. And they love the Osprey and um, the, the Osprey three-way. Those three stood out. I mean, they went to bed right after that, so they missed the main event. But um, they they absolutely loved it, and that's exactly who it's appealing to. I thought that was a very good match. I think Hologram looks great. I'm still convinced it's Tony Khan. He just shaves everything <laughs> down right before he comes out and goes into that ring. It's Tony Khan, dude. That's the unveil. I'm telling you. <laughs> that's my great. scoop. <laughs> that's my scoop. Don't listen to what these other guys are telling you. It's this person. It's that person. No, it's Tony. He's been doing this his whole life. Since 14 years old, he's been training for this moment. We got Darby Allen defeating Brody King. Essentially, it was exactly what I thought it would be. Brody killed him the whole match. Darby made his return. He beat him at the end, and they shook hands. That, that, yeah, that was kind of out of character for Brody King. But this clearly sets yep. up what sets happened up. at the end of the show. It does. Mm. And, uh, you know, he is. they do have a story where Brody helped them. A lot early mm -hmm. in his career. So there is a story there. Or, or vice versa. Darby helped them as a return or whatever it was. The Young Bucks. Private party. AEW World Tag Team Champions. Championship. The story here was the Young Bucks at one point at the end almost lost it with a roll up. And they hit the, uh, the Meltzer driver on uh, Zay to win. I don't know. I was kind of out of it for this one. Yeah, I wasn't as having, invested um, as I normally would having be. Having top flight, I'm sorry, but having top flight ringside, that was distracting to me. I was like, why are they there? What are they doing? Are they getting yeah. involved in this match? That that it just yeah, there was there was some things I liked and some things I didn't. I did like uh private party hit and bang for your buck on on the young bucks. I thought that yeah, was pretty cool. That was good. That was good. I mean, listen, it wasn't bad, but 
my issue with private party is not them. It's that they've not been presented on TV as world title contenders. Yep. Where are their wins after every week? You know, give me like six weeks of them on TV winning everything and looking really good. By that, by that account, the out the outrunners should be in the world title mix, not them. Didn't they just get murdered by John Moxley a couple of weeks ago? Uh, like a month ago, yeah. yeah. He broke. He supposedly broke or took took a hammer to one of their hands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mark Briscoe, Chris Jericho, Ring of Honor World Championship. Uh, I, you know, I didn't hate this match. I didn't hate it. Mark Briscoe's great. He's fantastic. Jericho did his thing. He won by a jade driller where, uh, on commentary was Jim Ross. And he started yelling at Tony Schiavone to explain what, what's coming up. Cause he didn't, <laughs> he's like, what is that? What's coming up? Explain it to oh, people. My. I was like, oh, here comes cranky JR. Love it. Uh, this was fine. <laughs> Mark Briscoe retained. Now you got the main event. John Moxley, Brian Danielson. The match started. Danielson comes out, final countdown. John Moxley doesn't even let let the proceedings to happen of the announcement of the match. He attacks attacks uh Danielson. They fight on the outside while the music is playing. Much like how New Jack would have his music playing. I guess Tony's trying to get every penny that he has pennies worth by playing that song. <laughs> it's a lot of money for that song uh they would brawl all on the outside they were fighting everywhere john moxie would attack danielson during the final countdown like i said uh then the match started moxley essentially was dominating the whole match right did you see it like that mm-hmm. yeah and and not only did he do that it, it looked like he was just going to just murder him early in the match and then yeah. of course when danielson starts making his comebacks that's when the, the crowd came in really got into it yeah um, so they're brawling danielson makes his comeback da- uh moxley puts him in a uh a rear naked and moxley just uh, danielson just couldn't get out and that was it and he just and the, the ref called the match, and I ref think calls the, it. I think that just deflated the and entire the entire. You definitely. heard yeah. the gasp of that crowd of that mm-hmm. eight thousand seventy eight hundred people or so. You heard the gasp, dead silence. Moxley's the champion. Danielson is in the corner, and the beatdown begins. And when Wheeler Yuta came out, and I saw him behind, I goes, "Oh, he's going to be the one to." do the final blow. Yeah, Wheeler comes out <laughs> pretending to help to help uh uh Danielson. Also, you had a number of stars Darby come out, came out. Darby, Darby, Darby came comes out. out to stop it from happening. Uh They duct taped him to the they, ropes. They yeah. duct taped them to the <laughs> ropes and they put the plastic bag over Danielson's head and they suffocated him again. Uh Really, and that's and the final scene was him getting stretchered out of the match, and that's it. You know, Brian Alvarez was there with Vinny, and Brian on Observer Radio this morning said that there's only been a couple of moments where the crowd has just been so quiet. They like there's no sound as they left the building. Like nobody was talking about it. Nobody was saying anything, and it was a very somber moment. And sometimes you need that in pro wrestling, right? This is me now saying that, Brian. You kind of need that. Not everything could be a happy moment to go home to. Sometimes you need to tell the story of these vile, disgusting heels that get over on you. And that was a story here with Moxley. They systematically took out the greatest pro wrestler in that company. But why? That's the question. Why? Who? Who's telling them to do this? Who could I mean, it be? Does it have to be somebody? Does it have to be a no? Yeah, on commentary, they made it very clear that it's a somebody. Mm. Okay. Tony Schiavone on commentary made it very clear who's giving the instructions to John Moxley to do this. Who is the higher power? Oh Jesus! You know, there's a number of people that it could be, right? 
Shane is somebody that people keep rumor rumoring <sighs> that it is. You know, I don't know how well that fits. I would Shane be a benefit to that company? I think so. I I, I would say Shane McMahon would be an an asset to have. I don't know in what capacity. But a lot of people are also thinking this is some sort of tie-in for Sammy Callahan to come in because of his relationship with John Moxley. I don't know if that's a reality or not. But then if it isn't those two, who, who could it be? Whatever you're doing has to be a big thing here. It can't fizzle out. And sometimes with AEW programs like this and, and the angles like this, it kind of does fizzle out. This is a pretty big one with major momentum behind it. I don't know. Maybe it is Shane. We're going to find out soon, I'm willing to bet. Who would you say it is? Would you guess anybody or no? You can't even think of anybody. I, I, I don't even want to. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just like, I want it just to be him being the, that guy that just said, look, I'm changing, I'm changing my attitude and this is what we're doing now because we need to. Yeah. But you might be right. There might be a, someone behind it pulling the strings. I, I hope there is. I think that'd be a great unveiling. You know what? You can milk this for a little bit. If you, if you have to wait for somebody really big for it to be, you should wait. And let it unveil over time. Don't rush it to get somebody on. When we come back, final segment of the show, we're going to talk a little bit about the scrum. Some highlights from here. It wasn't a very newsworthy media scrum, but it was still something. Wrestling Observer Live here on Sports Byline. Stay tuned. Wrestling Observer Live, final segment of the show here on Sports Byline. This media call, the media scrum, not much happened here in the scrum. Tony Khan was not there. He said that he was headed to the hospital with Danielson. Most likely, he was headed to London for the Jacksonville Jaguars football game. It was hosted by Tony Schiavone and Nigel McGuinness. Uh, just, I'm going to skip around here. The most newsworthy worthy part was Takeshita and Don Callis. It was clear uh, Don listens to the Observer shows, which you could tell when Vincent Verhey. Big Vinny V asked Takeshita how he felt to be cheered. Takeshita reiterated that he is the alpha and promised to defend the title all over the world. Don Callis then called Vinny's question a producer Rob level question. <laughs> a lot of inside baseball here, Observer fans. Brian Alvarez asked Takeshita uh, what determined him to wanting to be a pro wrestler. Takeshita said that wrestling is the best sport and it's the all time best. Uh, Callis called Alvarez a stooge. <laughs> Takeshi also said that he would defend the title all over the world. Tony Schiavone then wrapped up the conference saying that he's excited about the renewal with WBD and their new deal with Fox Sports in Mexico. He's excited for his career to go for another four or five years. Thanks to that. That was a nice little detail we got there. Man, Tony Schiavone has been on a roll, man. Second half of his career, and it's been as good as the first. I absolutely love it. Um... And that was it. That was really not much. So far, set for Dynamite, we have Mercedes Monet and Queen Aminata. I'm sure we'll get something announced for uh, the middle of the week, during the week for this show. And hopefully, we'll get Bobby Lashley that shows up, because that's the big rumor here. And that's the program for Swerve. Swerve versus uh, Shelton Benjamin and Bobby Lashley. Maybe he could have someone show up on his side. Exciting stuff. But that's it for this week, guys. We'll be back next week with another Wrestling Observer Live. See you next time.